New York City Mayor's Office declared a state of emergency in New York City due to the growing monkeypox outbreak. Hmm, I'm back, I'm back home. I'm Kareem and I just got back from New York City yesterday and had an awesome time with um, Kareem and Nana and Bashir. And now we end up back to Chinatown leaving this area, Little Italy, and going back to the car. Something better not bite me too, now you got me paranoid. Yeah. You technically you should mix it up. There's the light! Okay, well, not... Wow! Your brother is pooped! <laughs> it's not that sweet. A cream so you don't see yourself one day. No. no. I gotta show you Nana. And I thought, you know what? Why don't I share a video uh, giving you some tips about travel? And not just your general tips, but tips from the perspective of a physician. So if you're new here, my name is Habiba and I am a content creator or influencer, if you wanna call it that, and artist, mom, <laughs> wife, uh, I have three teenagers and I also have a background in medicine. I have been a licensed physician for over 20 years. And so I, like you, am very curious and interested about what's going on in the world today. And it's a lot, it's a lot. How to protect yourself while traveling. And these are real life tips uh, that I hope will be helpful to you because even if you're not traveling, I'm sure you have a child, I'm sure you have a spouse that might be traveling. Sit back, relax, get your pen and paper, and let's learn a thing or two, okay? So as a physician or medical provider, prior to 2020, whenever I would personally travel, my main fear or focus was not getting a blood clot. Okay, but since 2020, since the pandemic, like most of you all, uh, my fear has also been about not getting COVID. And now as of uh, this month, August 2022, or as of July 2022, at least here in the US, the next focus is, or in addition to COVID, while traveling, we're worried about monkey pox. So if you don't know, according to the World Health Organization, um, the current global medical concerns that, uh, they, uh, that are out there are monkeypox, COVID, and also polio. So I'm not gonna talk about polio here right now. As it relates to travel, we're gonna talk about protecting yourself from COVID, protecting yourself from getting a blood clot, protecting yourself from getting this monkeypox okay so we're definitely going to talk about the um, symptoms and risk factors and also what you can do to protect yourself so let's start with some general travel tips right you know the general stuff the non-medical stuff so number one things like make sure you copy before you go anywhere if you're going especially internationally or you're going somewhere far make sure you photocopy or take a picture of your major documents like your passport like your license like your health records make a picture of that you know on your cell phone and then send an email to yourself that way you have a copy with you at all times a digital copy of your passport again and of your documents email it to yourself in the event that you lose it during your trip so that would be one tip i would have for you under general things like carry a pair of socks with you during you know your trip a pair of socks on your carry-on so obviously when you fly or in a train or on a bus Sometimes it can get really cold, so make sure you have a pair of socks and maybe an extra jacket or sweater or cardigan with you um, with your carry-on. A lot of people don't always think about that. They think about the current temperature. Oh, it's hot. I'm not going to need any extra clothing. No, you might. You might. You definitely might. Okay, what else? 
make sure you carry a water bottle. I'm telling you, there's going to be so many instances where that water bottle or travel flask comes in handy. So not don't come with it full with any liquids because you will not be allowed on the plane with any liquids and I found that out the last time I traveled to New York I was coming back from New York I had a bottle of water they made me throw it out but you can bring an empty container with you and why is that necessary or why is that helpful well when you get to the airport drinks are extremely expensive very very expensive and if you have a container an empty container the airport has places now safe places where you can fill up with water or whatever you want right and then also sometimes on the plane you might want you know your coffee really hot or you might want to be able to you know drink it later having a flask with you um, could be helpful definitely make sure you keep your family and friends updated you always hear these horror stories about people going on vacation things happened and the family didn't know so no matter where you're going make sure somebody else knows where you're going and where you are along the journey also make sure you bring your chargers <laughs> and this seems like basic but how many times has someone gone somewhere and realized, oh my God, I don't have the charger for my phone. I don't have a charger for my uh, camera. Under general tips for travel, I think my last one's going to be wear comfortable clothes. I mean, I know some of us, especially the fashion influencers, wanna look cute, wanna look nice, and, and that's cool. But I think ideally, be comfortable. Be cute and comfortable. <laughs> At the beginning of this video, I said that whenever I would travel prior to 2020, um, one of my main concerns, again, given my medical background, was not getting a blood clot. So let's talk about what kind of people are at risk for developing blood clots. And when I say blood clots, I mean lower extremity blood clots, which are often called DVTs. DVTs mean deep venous thrombosis. You get a blood clot in your leg that happens to travel upwards or may travel upwards. If it travels upwards towards your lung and blocks an artery or vein, uh, or vein in your lungs, then it's called a pulmonary embolism, which is extremely extremely dangerous. So what kind of people are at risk for developing a deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism? Well, number one, travelers, long distance travelers are at risk. And basically anyone who is sedentary for a long period, which is why long distance travel, you know, becomes a risky uh, potential, right? Or risky factor. So anyone who is over 60 or the elderly who uh, doesn't move around a lot, anyone who is obese or overweight, overweight or obese may be at risk. Uh, anyone who is, again, very sedentary, anyone who may have been in a hospital for a long-term period and uh, now decides to travel, um, basically has been bed rest for a while, anyone who is on hormone replacement or birth control pills can be at risk, anyone who is pregnant can be at risk for DVTs or pulmonary embolisms. So that's a large group of people. So smokers are definitely at risk because they tend to have um, a hypercoagulable or a thicker uh, type of blood, uh, if you will, kind of simplifying it. And then also people who have a history of cancer, they tend to be at risk for pulmonary embolisms or uh, um, DVTs. So again, that's a wide range of people and I'm sure each one of you could probably find a risk factor there. What are the signs? What are the signs of a DVT or what are the signs of a PE specifically? Let's go with the extreme. What's the signs of a PE? Number one, it could be sudden shortness of breath. It might be chest pain, sudden shortness of breath. Um, it might be a swollen extremity, swollen lower extremity or swollen leg, um, painful swollen leg um, that you know did not look like that before. Bluish look to your lips or fingers basically suggesting you're not the person, you or the person is not getting enough oxygen. 
Um, so those are some of the typical main um, uh, symptoms and it is a very, very life-threatening condition. So what can you do during travel to make sure that you don't develop a DVT or don't develop a pulmonary embolism? And again, when I say travel, I'm talking about any travel that requires you to be sedentary or sitting for a large length of period. So whether you're traveling by bus, traveling by car, traveling by plane, whatever travel where you're sitting for a long period, this is what you can do to prevent those problems. Number one, move. You've got to exercise. And yes, I know it seems inconvenient. Who can exercise on a plane, right? How often can you actually move around? Well, you have to find an excuse to move your arms, move your legs several times um, during the hour. So if you have to use the excuse what I do, maybe use the excuse that I got to pee or I got to get up to use the restroom, um, then that's what you have to do. So like my trip to New York was literally just an hour. So not really a problem, but on longer trips, like let's say, I don't know, a trip to the Midwest from where I am or a trip to California, which is like half the day, you have to make sure that you get up at least once in two hours is my suggestion. Um, they actually again recommend that you move around or move your arms and legs several times during the hour. Another thing you can do is to get some compression stockings. So I'm sure you've seen older people wearing compression stockings and I definitely feel like it is not just something for seniors. Um, if you can get access to compression stockings, you can get it online. If you know that you're having to sit for a long period of time without getting up, or you're having even to stand for a long period of time without moving, then you should probably invest in some compression stockings. Um, compression stockings, compress has the name, compress your leg below the knee and therefore help prevent blood from being too stagnant and developing clots in the lower extremities, which can then travel up, right? So again, movement and maybe investing in some compression stockings, especially if you're a senior. And this is something you can discuss with your physician. Another thing you can consider, and this might be controversial because they've changed the guidelines, is maybe taking an aspirin, a regular aspirin, a few days before your travel. Again, this is something you might want to discuss with your physician because they have changed the guidelines when it comes to say a daily aspirin or even taking aspirin. It really depends on your cardiovascular risk and also knowing that aspirin may give you um, the risk or complication of some sort of GI bleed um, or hemorrhaging in the brain, which God forbid nobody wants, right? So aspirin does have risk but i know personally from traveling in the past i would take an aspirin but again ask your doctor i am a doctor but i'm not your doctor so go ahead and ask your physician uh, before you do this okay and then the next basic thing that you can do that is so important so important and yet easy to do is drink a lot of water it is a fact that if you are dehydrated or very dehydrated because you just have not been drinking enough fluids or enough water it makes your blood thicker your circulation your ability for your circulation to flow is somewhat diminished or cut down or compromise and so you're more likely to develop a clot. I will never forget this couple, the senior couple that I had um, that were visiting from New York and her husband wanted to get to North Carolina really quickly and so he refused to stop. The wife felt like she didn't want to inconvenience her husband so she didn't drink because if she would drink she realized that she would have to use the restroom so her husband's like we got to get there we got to get there i don't want to stop i don't want to stop and i know a lot of men who do this i don't want to stop so she didn't drink very dehydrated they got to where they needed to get to uh on time but now here she is with a blood clot it is very important to stay very hydrated and that's why that water bottle that I suggested earlier, empty water bottle or empty flask is also very important. And also, you know, if the stewardess comes by and offers drinks, 
if you would like to go ahead or at least take it with you because sometimes i know now also with the whole covid you know if you're wearing a mask you might not want to bother you know removing the mask especially if you have someone sitting next to you so i don't know that is up to you whether you want to drink on the plane or not i did drink while i was on the plane i pulled my mask down all right so to summarize how to prevent a pe or dvt while you're traveling exercise or move frequently whenever possible get up or stretch your legs or move your arms or even sometimes i do this thing where i just lift my bum up from the chair honestly i do this even if i if i know i can't get up and walk so exercise or move your body several times drink frequently and stay hydrated uh try to see if you can get some compression stockings uh, definitely don't smoke or you know quit smoking now is a good time to quit smoking among other things um, and see if your doctor recommends you take an aspirin maybe a few days before your trip okay so now let's talk about COVID and travel I know we've heard so much about COVID so many of us are tired about hearing about it and I'm not even gonna go into it you know the risks and uh, who's getting it and the symptoms we're not really going to go into that because i'm sure you've heard enough right what i will say is that i know that many of the states or many of the countries around the world have lifted the mandates but i believe obviously it's not over and i think even if your state or country has lifted the mandates i think we should wear a mask when it comes to travel okay you're gonna be with a lot of people sitting right next to you sometimes, walking by you in herds. So before we talk about monkeypox, let's talk about smallpox. And I find this quite interesting because as you have heard, monkeypox is genetically similar to smallpox, right? Those of us that were born around, you know, 1970 or before, 1972 and earlier got vaccinated for smallpox and myself included so i never really thought about it i always you know just knew that i had this scar on my arm where is it yeah so right here you see it i never really thought about it if i'm honest i just knew that i always had this scar never thought about smallpox but again if you were born prior to 1970 or 1971 you probably have that and so if you're an immigrant or if you're in the military or were in the military you also probably had that vaccination it was given to people or it was given to babies if you were at least one years old um, routine vaccination for smallpox was stopped in the united states around 1972. so then in 1980 the world health declared that smallpox had been eradicated globally meaning that vaccination or routine vaccination for smallpox specifically was not necessary. And why that's interesting is because now that they found that smallpox and monkeypox are genetically similar or genetically related, it's interesting that the vaccine for uh, smallpox has been found to um you know has been found to be protective against monkeypox in some individuals so you know when i heard this i was so excited because i was like yes finally there's a disease i cannot get but it goes deeper than that it's not that simple so after the smallpox vaccine you are immune to smallpox generally for three to five years where the 95 percent effectiveness and over time that percentage or your percentage of immunity goes down right obviously for those of us that were never given a booster that immunity has gone down so we are not out of the woods meaning that yes there are a percentage of us that are going to be immune or partially immune to monkeypox because we got vaccinated with smallpox but a large majority of us have a diminished amount of protection because it has been years since we got vaccinated and again uh, most of us did not have a booster to smallpox because the program was eradicated right 
So anyway, I just thought I would mention that. I thought that was interesting. Um, and I thought that, you know, again, it was pretty cool to know that I was part of a generation that got vaccinated for smallpox. I don't know. I thought it was cool. <laughs> Let's talk about monkeypox. It's a big deal and you should be concerned, especially if you are planning to travel. Again, I just said, we just got back from New York. New York appears to be one of the epicenters right now, right? And um, it was definitely on my mind coming back because I decided to change what I was wearing. So, okay, before we get to that, what are the signs of monkeypox? Well, you've seen the horrific pictures or the disturbing pictures. There's definitely a very distinct rash um, where you get a bump that almost looks like a pimple and then it gets filled with this whitish pus looking solution. And these lesions can last anywhere from two weeks to four weeks. Um, they're apparently incredibly painful, especially if you get anal lesions. Um, you've probably seen the pictures of people with it on their face, but the lesions can be anywhere. So some of you are seeing the pictures with them on their face, but it might be on their arms, spread out sporadically on their arms, on their torso, um, um, and again, around their genitalia. Um, yeah, then there's also fever, headache, fatigue. Uh, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. So you want to do your best to make sure you don't get it. And the thing about this monkeypox is that it is not just in West Africa right now. It has traveled globally. So it is in Europe and it is in pretty much every country um, of the of the world. And currently it is definitely spreading fast in the United States. And like I started off with, New York has declared a state of emergency because of this monkeypox. So we should all take it very seriously, especially if you are traveling or if you have people coming to your area or if you're interacting with people from different areas there, what kind of communities or people are at risk? Well, one risk factor or one group that ha appears to be uh, highly at risk that you've heard about are the um, homosexual uh, or gay community uh, amongst the men in particular. Uh, but it is ignorant to think that it is only amongst gay or amongst gay men. Um, it is definitely something that men and women of any age uh, can get. Um, as long as there's some kind of physical contact or skin to skin contact, whether you're male or female, you can get it. Okay. Um, children are also at risk. If you think about children under the age of eight, they like to touch freely. Uh, they put their hands everywhere. And so, uh, that, and for other reasons, they are also uh, a group that is highly at risk. Uh, pregnant mothers are at risk, nursing mothers are at risk, and apparently it's been shown that uh, a pregnant woman can pass the virus through the placenta to the baby. So pregnant women really have to be careful about, you know, exposing themselves uh, to this monkey pox. Okay, and then two other groups that I did not mention that are at risk. Anyone who has a compromised immune system and when we say compromised immune system, that could be anyone who is on high dose steroids, for example. Um, and there are many different medical conditions that may cause you to be on high dose steroids. Um, another group that would be at risk would be cancer patients or people who have had, say, bone marrow transplants or some sort of transplant. They would be considered at risk. Um, also people who have compromised skin. So if you think about people whose skin is chronically irritated and broken, that would be like people with severe acne um, because monkeypox can be passed with uh, direct skin to skin contact, prolonged skin to skin contact. So it doesn't, you don't have to have had sexual intercourse to get monkeypox. You can have hugged someone, you know, prolonged hug 
touching the face and you have let's say a compromised skin condition so if you have psoriasis if you have really bad eczema where your skin is chronically broken or um, irritated you really really need to be careful we got to go to that french kissing thing mwah, mwah. don't touch my face <laughs> and i hate the fact that again as someone who is very um affectionate and uh, touchy-feely in general. I love to give hugs. Uh, um, I love a good hug. This is not the time. This is definitely not the time in our history to be doing that. So um, be really careful, especially if you fall into one of those risk factors or populations or groups of people that I just mentioned. All right, so let's talk about how it is spread. Um, I again have said that it is spread through skin to skin contact, but it is also spread through any bodily secretions. So if that person has some respiratory secretions, they sneeze really hard or coughed really hard and you, you got in contact with those respiratory secretions, you can get monkey pox if they are infected. Okay. So respiratory secretions, any bodily secretions, which is why um, sexual intercourse is a very um, major risk factor with someone who has monkeypox. Um, so any touching of the genitalia, you don't act again, you don't actually have to have sex with that person. If they have monkeypox and you are touching their genitalia, uh, the vagina, the anal area, any area down there, um, you can get uh, the infection if they are already infected. So keeping in mind COVID, keeping in mind this monkeypox, what can you do while traveling to, um, to protect yourself? So first thing, number one, number one, number one, number one, frequent hand washing. It sounds basic. It sounds so tiring and old, but honestly, when I walked through that airport and decided to look at it from the eyes of like a detective and look at it from the eyes of a physician and look at all the different entry points to uh, getting infected, I found so many different uh, opportunities to pick up the infection, you know? And so, for example, if you're walking down the escalators or walking up the escalators, you usually put your hands for balance you know you're holding your suitcase and then now you put your hands on the escalator so you got a uh, escalator handle you got to make sure you stop frequently to wash your hands they do the whole security check there is a time where you have to take your suitcase and all your personal belongings and put them in a bucket and sometimes other people security will touch it before you get it so after every security check or after every time I, um, you know, changed location or did some sort of activity, we would stop and find a place to wash our hands. Go into the restroom, wash your hands with soap and water, or if you can find in different airports now, they have, you know, some sort of alcohol or foam-based um, disinfectant for your hands, use it. I also definitely suggest that you bring some sort of disinfecting wipes because they're not going to let you carry, you know, a big bottle of disinfectant. No, but you can definitely carry with your carry-on a big thing of, yeah, wipes. Like I got these. This is a good example. I got these disinfectant wipes that I bought at a local store here. And it says kills 99% of bacteria and viruses. And uh, it includes killing the coronavirus. So you wanna make sure that any time you touch, and there are so many opportunities in the airport to touch the surface, or there's so many opportunities in the airplane, whether it's putting on your seat belt, we don't even think about that, who sat in the chair before us make sure you wipe down the chair if it is you know if it is wipeable uh, make sure you wipe down that de um, desk or table in front of you before they give you something to eat and afterwards I mean I was just like constantly cleaning cleaning my surroundings and cleaning my cell phone and my luggage whenever again we did some sort of activity um, along the process so I think this is relevant whether again you're in a bus or in a train or in a car with other people and then the next thing while traveling again seems 
common sense, avoid skin to skin contact. Of course, if you remember when you're sitting in a plane, people are sitting next to you really close, unless you're flying with like family or you're flying, uh, you know, first class or, you know, you're flying at a, a really nice plane where they have a lot of room. Typically your average plane, especially if it's small, the seats are small and the space between you and the next passenger is really tight. So for example, on the trip coming home, I was sitting next to a gentleman that I did not know and uh, he was wearing shorts and he was wearing a very short sleeve top and uh, or short sleeve t-shirt and I knew if I had been wearing what I'm wearing today or if I had been wearing say a tank top or something without sleeves I would have been touching him so this is my suggestion for you it's not something the CDC has said it's not something the World Health Organization has said this is something my common sense <laughs> is saying wear something light if it is hot but wear something long sleeve and make sure your legs and arms are covered because I'm telling you, otherwise there's going to be a chance that you bump into the next passenger sitting next to you or you rub skin. And the thing is, nowadays you have to assume anyone that you do not know, anyone that you do not know sitting next to you or walking by you could potentially have COVID or this monkey pox, okay? So you have to protect yourself. Another thing that may seem common sense is avoiding using other people's utensils or avoid using other people's cups or, you know, personal stuff um, that you may not have thought about before. This is not the time, not the time, which is why also, again, I go back to if you are traveling, I think it is helpful to bring a um, water bottle with you or a or a washable travel flask you know something that you can reuse for either food or reuse for your drinks and again don't share personal utensils with other people this one is a recommendation from the CDC and of course it seems common sense do not have sex with anyone who has monkeypox I mean, obviously, if you know they have monkeypox, you're not going to have sex with them, right? But what if you didn't know? What if you didn't know? Well, you would probably know if they're having symptoms. If anyone that you come around has those skin, typical skin lesions, or has lesions that you are not sure about, not have sex with them or have any intimate contact with them. Do not have, the CDC says, do not have sex with. But they actually also say, do not cuddle do not kiss, uh, do not cuddle, kiss, or hug anybody who has monkeypox. So it's really about avoiding any kind of physical contact. And that's what you want to avoid while you're traveling. And I know it is hard at times, but you really, really have to in this particular atmosphere. Here's another thing that the CDC does say which also may appear to be common sense, but may not be common sense to some. You wanna avoid using, again, any of their personal items or sharing things like towels. You know, how many times have you traveled with someone and maybe you borrow a towel or you pick up their towel? You definitely don't wanna do that with someone who has monkey pox. And again, I'm saying with someone who has monkey pox, but what if you don't know? What if you don't know that that person has monkey pox? Which is why just treat everyone as if they potentially have monkey pox while you're traveling. So do not use their towels, do not use their sheets. And that raises the question, what if you go into a sketchy hotel or you go into a sketchy home where you know you're not sure who slept there before you did they change the sheets did they change the towels so now my thing is i think if i am traveling um you know to non-family that i don't trust you know in this last instance i was traveling to new york to my mom and to my brother i absolutely trust them right and i know that they're very careful and none of them are sick and none of them have monkey pox or have gone anywhere you know really um, but if I were going somewhere that was, you know, non-trustworthy or I wasn't sure, just had that little bit of doubt, then I think it's not too, too much, or I don't think it's, um, over the top to maybe bring one set of sheets with you. 
um, one set of sheets with you and maybe uh, your own personal towel because honestly, unless you can verify that that hotel or wherever you're going is giving you fresh sheets, fresh towels, you know, or, or fresh robe, I personally, in this current atmosphere, wouldn't use it if it's not mine. So, um, I don't know what you think about that, but these are my tips when it comes to traveling. So overall, if I had to summarize with everything that's out there, I would again go back to wear your mask while traveling, wear your mask. I don't care what they're saying out there. I think you might need your mask. Um, uh, because there are too many respiratory droplets out there. You know, again, if it's not COVID, now it's the monkey pox. Uh, and then there's also polio, which I didn't even go into. Um, but although I don't know that that's a major issue right now in the United States, I'm talking as someone who's living in the U.S. Wash your hands frequently, carry your sanitizer, carry your sanitizing wipes, um, Avoid skin contact with anybody. Um, avoid intimate contact. This is not the time to be going to other countries and sleeping with people you don't know or having casual sex. Um, this is just not the time. And um, yeah, I think that's all. I have said enough. <laughs> and I look forward to sharing our New York vlog with you, our experiences with Bashir and Nana and all the fun things that we did. I will be sharing that. I hope you enjoyed or found this video informative. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to share this with someone who might be traveling soon or save this video for yourself for your next travel um, experience. And before you leave, let me know how you are protecting yourself during this travel season or uh, what you've done uh, different than you've done before to protect yourself. And uh, let me know, drop a comment below. What are you doing differently or what have I left off that you think is important for people to know? I hope you have a wonderful summer vacation if you are going somewhere new. Bye!